Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Oblong Online event for How Beautiful We Were by Mbolo Mbwe in conversation with Lacey Schwartz Delgado. My name is Lacey Cantrell, and I'm Oblong's digital and events manager, and I will be your tech host this evening. So before we begin, I just want to give a couple of housekeeping notes. There's a buy the book button down at the center of your screen that will lead you to sign copies of How Beautiful We Were. There's also an ask a question button to the right of the buy the book button. If at any point during the event you have a question for Mbolo or for Lacey, please feel free to enter the question there. We love your questions and we would love to have your participation this evening. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest. Mbolo Mbwe is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Behold the Dreamers, which won the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction and the Blue Metropolis Words to Change Prize and was an Oprah's Book Club selection. Named a notable book of the year by the New York Times and the Washington Post and a best book of the year by close to a dozen publications, the novel has been translated into 11 languages, adapted into an opera and a stage play and optioned for a movie. We are here tonight to celebrate the release and discuss her newest book, How Beautiful We Were, which has been named a most anticipated novel by over 30 media outlets and which has been heralded with praise since this Tuesday's release. The New York Times Book Review called the novel sweeping and quietly devastating, profoundly affecting, and NPR reviewed it as a vast second novel with smooth prose, how beautiful we were, tells the multi-generational saga of one small village's battle, not just against one corporation and the dictator who profits from its avarice, but against neo-colonialism itself. Umboy reaches for the moon and has it firmly held in her hands. In conversation with Mbolo this evening is filmmaker Lacey Schwartz Delgado. She is an award-winning writer, director, producer, storyteller, and outreach strategist who uses the power of narratives to build community and impact change. Lacey directed and produced her nationally and internationally recognized personal documentary, Little White Lie, and most recently, Lacey was co-executive producer with Alicia Keys of the documentary, How It Feels to Be Free, for PBS's American Masters, which examines the overlooked contributions of black female performers. Welcome, Lacey. I will now pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Hi, Molo. How Hi, are you? Lacey. Nice to see you again. It's nice to see you too. And I'm incredibly excited to discuss this book. And there's not only there's so much to say about it. Um, right. But before we do, I know probably so many people have not read the book yet. Mm -hmm just came out this week. So I'd love to start, if you can you know, tell us in your own words, give us a summary of this book, tell us what this book is about. Yeah, um, it's a story about, first of all, thank you Oblong for having us here. It's nice to um, do something with a local bookstore. Um, so this is, um, this is a story about what happened when a small African village decided to fight against an American oil company that had been polluting its land for many years. And when the story starts, it starts in 1980 and it goes over 40 years. When it starts in 1980, the village has been contaminated for many years and um, the rivers are covered with toxic waste, um, the pipelines are spilling, the air is very, very dirty and the children in the village are dying. And, and all, the, all the oil company is doing is sending representatives to come and promise the villagers that things are going to get better, but nothing really does and the, and the children are dying and the parents are very upset and then one day, this a madman in the village decided that um, the village can and should do something. And so the village takes a stand and that opens, opens the door for this long, long drawn saga between this village and the company. I mean, it's really, it, it truly is a saga. Like, it's, a, um, it's an incredible book. And I would say, if I was to describe this book, I would describe it as, Beautifully written, incredibly intense, and <laughs> deeply, deeply thought provoking. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, I mean it, it is. It, it was an intense book to write. It was an intense experience writing it. <laughs> so, um, and I, um, it is a story that took me many years to write. It was something that I started um, in two thousand and two, and then I put it aside to write what became a debut novel, and then I went back to it in twenty sixteen, which was quite an intense year. So I suppose, you know, going back to 2016 had a lot to do with me being in that space where I was able to, 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 to finish it because it took a lot out of me to finish it. Why did you put it aside? Well, I got an, the inspiration to write Behold the Dreamers. Um, 
And uh, Beyond the Dreamers is just a very different story. This is a story that is set in New York City. It's about two families dealing with the financial crisis. And when I, after, I've been writing How Beautiful We Were for so many years. And so when I got the inspiration to write Beyond the Dreamers, I was so I was so happy to get out of this fictional African village and come back to New York City and to write a story with people taking subways and sitting on Colombo Circle and walking down streets that I know. And so that was quite a joy to, to sort of be in a place that was a lot closer to me physically than some fictional African village that only existed in my head. Um, so, but, but once Behold the Dreamers came out, I, um, I was compelled. I, I just, this story haunted me, so I knew I had to go back and finish it. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when you talk about um, talk about the, you know, what which one you felt closer to. I mean, obviously, this this is a village that does not exist. It is a creation of your imagination. But I would assume that it would be also inspired by some of your own experiences. And I would love to hear, you know, a little bit more about what your connection is to this place. You know, obviously, again, it's not a place that actually exists, so I can't say. You know how much of it is autobiographical, and I think just you know the 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 character, the main character of Ula, who um, who is born in the village, mm -hmm. gets educated, and then comes to the United States for eight years, mm -hmm. like, for eight years to study, to in a lot of ways not only study, um, get educational studies, but also how to really learn how to be an activist. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then comes back and we'll talk, I definitely have questions about the relationship mm. to America mm. and a variety of different other things, but it's interesting how much she comes and then even, you know, the, how she comes to the States. And I'm curious about, you know, your own story, how mm. much of it, you know, if any of it feels, I don't know if I want to say autobiographical, mm -hmm. but personally informed mm -hmm. um, from your own experience. And it's interesting, especially hearing you say that, um, behold the dreamers, you know, there was that, that's the thing you felt like you had more of a connection with. Right. Right. This village. Right. Well, at that time, when I got the inspiration to write Behold the Dreamers, it was 2011, and I had lost my job during the financial crisis, and my story was about the financial crisis with people in New York City. So from a physical level and also from an experience level, I was feeling more connected to that. But, but yes, I do have a few things in common. Um, I should just say that the character of Tula, who is the, the main character, she grows up to become a revolutionary. Right, and nobody is going to mistake me for a revolutionary. Like I, I am proud of who I am, but I am like Tula is, is you know, she's a force of nature. Um, but like her, I was also um, a skinny African girl. I was also very bookish. I came to America um, at, at, at the same age, seventeen, to go to college. Um, but I didn't grow up in a place like Kusawa. I am from a town called Limbe, which is. At, at this point, it's pretty, fairly cosmopolitan African town. It's actually quite a little city. Um, and But the one thing that we had in common with Kusawa is that my town also had the, the oil refinery, the main oil refinery in my, in, my, in my country. So I grew up aware of the politics of oil. Now, I wasn't aware of environmental degradation to the extent to which it is in the novel. But when I was young, there was an incident in Nigeria when a major environmentalist was executed for taking a stand against an, uh, against a, an oil company. And that certainly affected me. Um, but when I came to writing this book, it was coming from, um, from a place of being fascinated with revolutionaries and dissidents and activists and protesters. I've always had a very big fascination with these people and what they do, people who, who take a stand at great personal cost. And so when I wanted to tell the story, it was coming from a place of questions of what it's like to, 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 to do that, what it's what is like to, to not only take a stand against a major corporation, but to, but to take a stand against your own government, to take a stand against um, forces that are way powerful than yourself and, and all, the, all the costs that are involved in such a thing. So that was my main inspiration. Um, and I, because I grew up reading books by African writers, which were set in African villages, I felt very familiar. That Kosawa felt very familiar because the African writers like Ngugi Wationgo, he's not very well known in America, but he writes stories like this of African villagers taking stands. So um, that was a big part of the inspiration for that. Um, but 
Tula is, is very much a composite of revolutionaries that I admired as a child and as an adult. I'm talking about some of the 20th century's greatest revolutionaries from the Dr. Kings and Mandela, and Malcolm X and Patrice Lumumba, Steve Biko, all these men who did who, who were celebrated for, for, for taking stands. Um, I, I took a lot from their lives and put it into Tula. Mm. Mm. I mean, you definitely see it, and she's an she's really an incredible character. And just so that you know, other people know that the way the book is written, right? There is, I mean, there there is only one chapter actually from her perspective, right? Mm -hmm. and That's right. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly done in all the different perspectives, but you still get such a strong sense of her. I mean, I think the letters from her um, are incredibly effective. And listening to you talk about you know this idea of revolutionary is one of the there's so many different moments that struck me, but there was one when um, uh, in particular, there's a discussion around when she's thinking about taking, so first of all, when she comes to the United States mm -hmm. and she um, learns about different forms of activism and is actually she's really struck by the by seeing um, Americans protest against their own government. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, who would have thought such a thing you know, in Africa? <laughs> yeah. But I also, but the thing that was also really the most interesting I've seen is that the character of Austin in a sense says to her, you know, she says, I want to bring this back, right, to my country. I want, I want to do this. And they, and uh, the relationship, not only between the American company, but also in terms of how the American company and the relationship with the leadership in her country. Um, and he points out to her, though, that the way it's gone down here isn't necessarily the way that it's gone down near you and your right. <laughs> which right. I, I thought was really interesting just to think about this idea of when we look at you know, revolutionaries, when we look at uh, revolutions, when we look at protests, that they also can be geographically specific. Mm -hmm. And I love, you know, your thoughts about that and the relationship between this idea of like American protest, American right. revolution, right. and also more on the continent of Africa. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it's a good point. And you probably the first person to bring up that particular angle. Um, I, I should start off by saying that I grew up in a dictatorship. Um, our, the guy who was president when I was a child is still president. He's, he's been there for almost 40 years now. So growing up, I, um, I, the, there wasn't this kind of freedom that I saw in America where people can protest freely and, and get on television and lambast their, their president. So when I came to America, I was really fascinated by the American idea of freedom and, and American democracy. But, but to your point, it is, um, the, the, the world abounds in stories of failed uprisings and revolution, right? Until that was the point Austin was trying to say that you can try to go back to your country and, and you know, create a new country and start this movement. But look around you. I mean, right now, look at the case of Libya, right? We saw the Arab Spring and what happened in that part of the world. And a lot of things didn't exactly pan out the way the revolutionaries thought it would. So because at the, at the, at the root cause of all this is humans. And, and, and humans are driven by their own agendas. And so you can have a case where people have the best ob objective of creating a country where there's more justice, but human nature comes in and that plays a role. And soon before you know it, there's a lot of division and, and egos and, and lots of things that stand in the way of justice. So that is what Austin was trying to question Tula, that Revolutionary in theory, is, it being, a revolution in theory sounds great, but, but in practice, when you put many humans together, um, things might not go out, you know, like the way it does in textbooks. No, absolutely. And it's interesting because I think in a lot of ways, like I could think of the way that other books might go, you know, straight down one direction and make, you know, it's very easy to make, you know, the oil company mm -hmm. the um, villain. Mm -hmm. But there is also these various moments, and I don't want to like necessarily give away the end, but mm -hmm. the way that the end it really, these things are not um, necessarily, you know, black and white, as we say. Mm -hmm. And even in terms of the fact, like Austin's character is so interesting, and this happens earlier on in the book, but he is in relationship to one of the oil companies, but he's also the people who expose it. And right. there there's just all of these different, not only characters, but movements that mm -hmm. it, um, and how it all operates, mm -hmm. which is really, really uh, fascinating. And, right. you know, obviously I, I want to come back in a sense, in a second to the relationship to the United States, but I think it's um, one of the pieces that was also really interesting was 
the characters and their relationship to whiteness. Mm -hmm. You know, and as somebody, you know, that idea of them talking about, you know, this was their country, this was their village, this is where they thought that they were going, they, you know, they had come from, they were going to raise their kids, their grandkids. There was a whole kind of cycle of life that was continuing. And then their experiences with people coming in and that the oil company was not the first company. And before right. the Americans, mm -hmm. it was the British. That's right. <laughs> and it was really interesting to read the distinction to me about, you know, kind of the distinction they were making of like, okay, this is one form of whiteness. Right. And this is another form of whiteness, but it's a different form of whiteness. And right. I'd love uh, for you to talk about that a little bit. I mean, it's one, I'll be honest, it's very, I think uh, top of mind this week through the, there's a little lot of conversation around uh, Meghan Markle, mm. <laughs> royal family. And somebody, I just did another event last night where somebody um, asked me my thoughts on that. And my response was to talk about your book. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about, you know, yes. because this idea of colonialism mm -hmm. is something that we actually don't talk about that often. Right. Uh, Right. But I think your book hinted on both those things, so I'd love to hear your thoughts about well, it. Well, I, I think to your point, I mean, it is. Um, so this is so. As an African, right, I am very aware of what Af what Africa has suffered at the hands of of Euro Europeans for the most part. I mean, it started with slavery, right? So this is a novel that talks about how much through this village it shows what Africa has been through as far as being pillaged, right? First it was humans who were taken, and then later in the book we see the robber taken, and then later we see the oil taken, and this is just in one particular village, now never mind the rest of the continent. Um, so it is, um, I, I was very interested in exploring this, 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 this sort of idea where Africa has been used for so many years, and, and, and the people in the village, they don't exactly. They don't have a. They, they don't really have an identity as being black people, right? So there's there's no way that they really talk. Oh, this is happening to us because we are black. Um, but I remember something that I read while I was writing this book by the Israeli historian um, Noah Noah Harari, I believe that's his name in the book *Sapiens*, and he was talking about how a lot of uh, people think that. You know what happened to Africa, the slavery or you know diamonds or or or, or rubber, whatever that has been done to uh, has been pillaged from Africa. He said that it really has nothing to do with the fact that you're black. It has to do with the Western world and their needs. So people needed their sugar for their tea and they needed cotton to make their clothes. That is why they did what, what they did to Africa. It was just because there were these resources and they wanted it, and so they they took whatever they could take out of it. So. I wanted to show through this village how for generations, for even centuries, Europeans and later Americans have just come and taken what they wanted to take out of this place and not really thinking that these are humans, that these are humans who are who are worthy of consideration. Yeah, and the you I mean the humanity piece of the book is so so strong because I think that you know, as you're woven into this story, which does have a lot of heartbreak, does have a lot of intensity, it's also these amazing traditions and this amazing way of life and fundamentally like still seeing a lot of joy mm -hmm. and you know, and and a lot of um just seeing how the traditions play out, even around you know the celebrations of life after people pass away and even after really, really intense events occur, there's still a celebration of life. So I you know, I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit yeah. as well. Yeah, right, because, and that was that was part of, to show to show what they were fighting for, right? Yes, they were fighting to live in a clean environment, but these are people who are very connected to their land. They have a very strong connection to their ancestry. The fact that their ancestors walked on this land and lived on this land, and, and they hope to pass it on to the next generation, to their children and grandchildren. And so their, their, their customs, their connection, they, they talk about the spirit a lot. They, have, they believe in this, this divinity that they refer to as the spirit. That was all part of the essence of who they are. They have a lot of customs that that binds them to to their tradition. And so I, um, it, it wasn't enough to just say, okay, this is a village fighting to sleep, to live in a clean environment. It was it was important to also show who these people are. They're not just you know some African villagers. They are they are proud people. They are dignified people. They they have a wonderful culture that is worth preserving. And and we won't say what happened in the end, but. Part of what I hope to do in the novel was to show that this was 
there were very different priorities on both sides. Right? We have a corporation that wants all because we want to make its profit, and we have a village that wants to, you know, live in a simple place and hold on its ancestry. And so it was this sort of, you know, twentieth century, you know, battle from two people, two very different people with two very different priorities on what really matters most in life. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to ask you. I mean about a, a few like themes that come through in the film. And one of which you just kind of talked about is, is this idea of home. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, when I ended the book, that was what I was really left thinking about mm -hmm. is this idea of home. And I think even during this time, I mean, you know, so many people have moved around. We've, many of us have been stuck in our homes. Mm -hmm. Many of us have had to leave our homes to go places for a variety of different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and what was, you know, the power of home and that, you know, and even the idea that when some people left, um, and had like an, a, what some might call an objectively better life, right. um, they still wanted to come back home, right. you know, prior to live their last few days. And so I'd love, you know, the relationship to home just came across really, really right. strong. Right. Well, I did, I did leave my hometown at a very young age. I left at 17 and I've been living in America for most of my life at this point. So my, my first novel, Behold the Dreamers, has to do it with home a lot. The last word in Behold the Dreamers actually is home. Um, and, and, this, um, and this novel has a lot to do with that, to, to, to what um, to people trying to hold on to their home. Because I think that um, it, is, it is a huge part of us, you know, where we feel most comfortable, where we feel most loved. And the, there's a character, like you said, who struggles with where is my home and where do I really belong? And I think for me, being an immigrant in this country, I struggled with that idea for a long time. When I came to America, I was incredibly homesick. I was so miserable. I wanted to go back the earliest chance. Um, and I, it, it took me a long time. Actually, when I went to college and I met my friends, I started feeling a little bit at home. And then I moved to New York City. And, and I think New York City is the first time that I felt at home, which is why I live there. And I'm currently not there, not there but I am. Um, I know that that idea of, of being in a foreign place and being so desperate to be at home. And and um and I am happy that I found that in New York City. But and I can understand what what the characters were going through because for a long time I, I felt as if I didn't have a home. I'd lost my home in Cameroon and I hadn't quite fight to find a home in America. Hmm. Yeah. I mean it's definitely a theme that I think about. Um I really think about a lot and I love there's I mean there's a few like themes that I would I'm obviously dying to ask you about which is um another one is a theme of fear mm. and in kind of like the there I found myself you know sometimes you think like don't do that or don't do that. <laughs> and then it made me examine my relationship to that fear and mm. what actually you know knowing your purpose knowing what matters and right. actually there are worse things to lose than even your life arguably right. Right. So I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit. Well, so I think that that came that I think that angle comes from two places, and these are two different African revolutionaries that inspired that angle. Um, um, one was there's a quote by the great South African revolutionary named Steve Biko, who said, "You are either alive and proud, or you're dead." And mm -hmm. to me, that quote was very um, about you know go ahead and and be something or what's the point of life and the other quote was a quote about madness which was by, by another um, african revolutionary named thomas sankara and he talked about how you need a certain amount of madness to carry to, to bring about fundamental change in the world and so in the novel the person who gets this this fight against the oil company started is a madman and and the madman because of his mental illness, he, he has no fear. He's not worried about what the oil company will do to him. He's not worried about what the corporation will do to him. He doesn't even care what the fellow, his fellow villagers think of him. He's almost without fear. So it is this sort of madness. And I, I, I wanted to also celebrate madness, to celebrate, like Apple had a commercial called Yes to the Crazy Ones, where they had all these people who had done so much in the world and, and they're celebrating the idea that, that it's almost crazy to 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 go out and not be afraid, but but that is worth celebrating, and and that is Tula, the main character. She has a lot of that. She's she's quite um, she's she's quite unafraid, and she's willing to risk a lot, which is what I found that in my research on on a lot of the men who who inspired her, because that character was very heavily researched. I, I realized that not only are they not very much afraid, but they also have an unbelievable ability to hope. These people 
have so much hope. They are just, it's almost like something in their DNA that compels them to, to, to not worry, to know that I'm going to do this. And, and I really believe that something is going to happen because I'm putting all this effort into it. I mean, it's interesting because that was another theme that I'm like looking at my book right now. Another theme that came up for me that I wrote down is is about this idea. The relationship of hope um, was one that was really strong. Um, and again, I thought I just thought that one of the the relationships to America, right? Where in certain ways, the, in every way, the American company was the issue. Mm. So that, but at the same time, it also represented hope. It represented opportunity, nonetheless. Right. And that right. relationship is so. And you know, reading from page three twenty two, it says they had shared stories about the America of two thousand seven, how a woman just became the third most powerful person in the government there, and how some men were fighting for the right to marry each other, which made the elders laugh so hard they nearly lost the rest of their teeth. And then similarly, um, this idea of democracy. Um, so if you look at countries on page 335, it says, if you look at countries with a history of stable governments, she wrote, you'll see that they have solid foundations created by those who came before them. The Americans are standing on a foundation created by their founding fathers. European monarchs created foundations for the kinds of countries their descendants would live in. Who created a foundation for our country? No one, we were different tribes thrown together with no common green dream, excuse me. We were forced to build upon sinking sand and now we're crumbling from within. And it's this idea of like comparison, but also still holding on to that, to that hope. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and that is why, that is why America was very significant in creating, in, in Tula, Tula's awakening as this, as this leader. Um, I mean, it has a lot to do with education, right? So Tula edu gets educated, but there's something about this country where you come to and you have a mind like Tula's and you come here and you see you see democracy in action you see people marching and protesting and, and I know of course I'm a citizen now I know that this country is, is, is quite flawed but there's a reason why a lot of people came to America and went back to their countries and become agents of change because there is a lot of inspiration in this country I looked I, 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 Malcolm X is an inspiration for Tula, so is Dr. King, so is Angela Davis, because I looked at, at the way they saw themselves and the way they had learned about the world and how they could use it. And so, and that is the same thing I imagine that Tula also, also studied. She, she, she looked at um, a lot of American leaders and she was involved in protests herself. And that really gave her, um, that really gave her the the, the 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 belief that if it can happen in America, and like you said earlier, you know, Austin tells her that well, right, it hasn't exactly happened <laughs> very much in Africa, but because she's so hopeful, she really believes that if the Americans could do it, if they could create a foundation on which they could build a democracy, we can also create a foundation on which we can build a democracy. And at some other point in the novel, she talks about how it might take many years, it might take generations, but we can we can have a country like America one day also. Americans are humans like the rest of us. And so why can't we also have a country like that? Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, what you said earlier about this idea of the fact that there is, you know, there's the ideal doesn't necessarily exist, but it's also for what you are um, really trying to be, That's not right. just what in fact you are. You know, it's what we're striving for. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes the defining thing. I think even when it's not actually the the full realization of it, we're always coming into that realization. And and um, and so I want to ask you about one more theme, and I just want to encourage everybody. Um, watching, please share questions. We're gonna, I have a few more questions, but then I'd love to uh, take your questions as well from Bolo. Um, I also wanted to talk about freedom, the mm -hmm. idea of being free. I mean, it's a topic that I think about all the time as Leif mm -hmm. just shared. We just had a film come out called How It Feels to Be Free mm -hmm. and this idea of freedom. And you know, I wrote down a few quotes and it's interesting how it moves through the book, you know, saying, uh, page 102, it says, we are the only ones who can free ourselves. Page 315, it says, um, what does it mean to be free? Which I think is a big... <laughs> now, I thought about that when, I, when you mentioned your, your title. I said, oh, were we thinking the same thing? Because you have to be free. And I said, what does it mean to be free? And then on page 30, 339, I have to let go of any hopes of being free. I mean, this idea of, first of all, freedom is both um, how do we feel about freedom, but it's also a, a question of defi defining what does it even mean to be free. And I think for mm -hmm. somebody, especially as any type of marginalized person, um, that is always a question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on on this idea of freedom. And 
Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, so the, for, personally for me, I think that nobody can tell you what your freedom feels like. Right. Freedom is a very individual thing. Um, I so my my last book, Behold the Dreamers, had a lot to do with people going after the American dream and working really hard for it because they believe that achieving it will give them a certain kind of freedom. And and some of them finding that it really doesn't. And so this is also a book where people try to figure out what that means, right? I think for a lot of these characters, freedom just means freedom from this corporation breathing down their neck and freedom from the, <laughs> the dictatorship. But but on a more personal level, what does freedom mean? What does your freedom look like? Because your freedom is not the same as my freedom. Um, the people who could be sitting in prison and are feeling free, the people walking on the street and don't feel free. Uh, so I think sometimes somebody like Tula, she has an idea of what freedom is because she believes that freedom, freedom involves every day, everybody in the community being having certain rights and privileges. And, and later, the character you mentioned who's talked about not having any more hopes of being free because this is a character who has made a lot of choices that that are weighing on his conscience, but he has to balance that with with the desire to um to have a free conscience, basically. And so I um I, I maybe because I talk about freedom a lot on college campuses and not, I'm always curious about everybody's individual definition of freedom because it really is it, it chains come in different ways, right? The, the physical chains and the metaphorical chains also. And, and nobody can tell you what your chains are and what it means to break out of those chains. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, we're working on this other project. I mean, it's just a theme that comes up all the time. And I think it's a, it's an endless one. And as you, as you point out, completely and totally subjective. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to transition before you know, ask some of the questions that people are going to be sending in. I'd love to transition a little bit of talking a little more a little bit more about um, you know this book and this process in terms of your creative process. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I saw in your um, in your um, acknowledgments that you acknowledged a woman, Susan Camille, who I have to share that I had the opportunity a month mm -hmm. before she passed away, an incredible editor, mm -hmm. to have a meeting uh, with her, mm -hmm. and I walked away from one hour with this woman who we had a mutual friend mm. and feeling like I had met somebody who would help me birth stories. It mm. would for me. And I've now, you know, through just, just felt so connected to her and mm. um, have other friends who have worked with her and have had the opportunity to have more conversations. And I mm. knew you gave her a really heartfelt acknowledgement. Mm. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up and just in general, talk about, you know, the people who have helped your work come mm. to be because mm. like, just having a, a brief meeting with this woman, it just mm. seems like a gift. And yeah. you acknowledge that in your, in your acknowledgements. Yes, yeah, she was, she was my publisher and, and, a, um, and she became a good friend of mine. I, um, definitely a major heartbreak when she passed away. Um, but yeah, so I, I was unpublished before my first novel, my, my, my wonderful agent, who is probably on this watching right now, Suzanne Golom, she mm -hmm. was the one who, <laughs> who read my manuscript and said, you know what, I think I'm going to, um, I'm going to take you on. And then she took me to Random House and I met my former wonderful editor, um, David Ibeshop, who is also the, the author of the novel, The Danish Girl. Mm. And, and it took, we, so together we worked on it and, and David, um, at some point, you know, he was no longer at Random House, but I was there with Sudan Camille, and now I have a new editor, and the great Andy Ward, who is my editor for How Beautiful We Were. But I, I, I just want to say that it is, like I said, you know, a book it needs a lot of, you know, at least, okay, a writer needs a lot of attention and help. <laughs> so I give credit to my editors, and Andy, um, Andy and Susan Camille, they really held my hand. I remember one time in the midst of writing this book, I was, it was a very difficult book to write. I had really had moments. I spent many, many hours sleeping on the couch, feeling sorry for myself, like, oh, I don't think I can do this. Um, and Susan Camille would send me emails like, you can do it. And she took me out to dinner one time and she said to me, um, she said, you're gonna finish it and I'm going to love it. <laughs> And I said, how do you know you're going to love it? She's like, because you wrote it, I'm going to love it. So it was just one of those things. You need, you need a lot of that. And I also have wonderful friends who've been very supportive of, of me, but it definitely was grueling emotionally to, to, um, 
to write a book that just didn't seem as if it was ever going to finish, right? It was it was a lot of back and forth with my editor. And then I had my friends who read it. And one of my friends sent me like five pages of critiques and every, something like, even something like the, the name of the, the oil company. Um, it's called Pexton, that's the name of the oil company. But before I had a name, and one of my friends, Warren, said, that doesn't sound like an American oil company's name, so I had to like find a new name. So it was all these little things. And, and finding a new name for an American oil company, it's not that easy. I had to like think, OK, what does an American oil company sound like? Chevron, Exxon, Pexton? And that's how I came up with Pexton. <laughs> it was all these you know, pushbacks. and uh, but. I definitely, I'm one of those writers that I also, I love criticism. I mean, while I'm writing the book, not after I'm writing it, because I don't want to hear your opinion when I'm done writing it as far as critics, but while I'm writing it, I really welcome um, feedback. So I had my friends read and reread and critique it, and and um, and that is what really helped me. It really did. But I, I had lots of low moments when I thought that the story was just, it just overwhelmed me a little bit, and I wasn't sure whether I was going to make it across the finish line. Hmm. Amazing. So I'm going to, I have a, I could ask you a million more questions, but I'm going to go to, um, to some of the ones from the audience. Hi, everyone out there. Uh, so from Catherine, we have, besides homesickness, what were the major challenges you faced as a 17 year old emigre? Hmm. Uh, I think that was the main one. I think I, I missed my mother terribly. I missed my friends. Oh, the cold also. Ooh, ooh, yes. I, I wasn't prepared when I came. I arrived um in the fall and, and nobody had warned me about winter. And I arrived from West Africa and I went to Chicago. And you don't want to be in Chicago the right after you come from West Africa because that cold is no joke. And so I had a very hard time with being cold. So between being cold and missing my family, um, I think that was the biggest thing. Because once I started making friends, I went to college, um, I, um, I, I started feeling better. But I would say that back, so I came in 98, people did not have cell phones back then. My mother did not have a phone in her house. So the only way I communicated was through writing letters. And so Tula, write, Tula writes a lot of letters when she comes to America, and that was for my life. Because when I came here, I wrote letter after letter to my mother, to my friends, to my cousins. I, it just was like a very big letter writing life. And, and so I, um, writing letters definitely was something that helped me feel a little bit more at home. And there was, I mean, as you said, it's something that Tula does. And also, she's also quite cold when she comes. <laughs> yeah. That's also something that, that was, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, So, I mean, the book just came out uh, this week. Two days ago, that's right. Yeah. Um, and seems like some people have already read it. So there's... Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, one question from Ricky Brody, the book was amazing, although the book takes place in a fictional location, certain corporations or government could imagine it as a commentary in life there. How was this book accepted at home? I mean, I don't even know if it's out yet. No, not yet. Or do you anticipate re repercussions? Oh, well, <laughs> well, it's funny because I am from, I come from a country that is ruled by a dictator and I am, um, and the detective, she puts, it puts writers in prison all the time. Right? Growing up, like I thought being a writer was the most dangerous job because every other day, a journalist was in prison, a writer was in prison, writers were in prison all the time. So when I, um, so I have a friend from my country and I told him, I said, oh God, what should I do? They're going to put me in prison when I go home. He's like, please, nobody's putting you in prison. <laughs> like, like, like I, so I, I, I don't exactly come out and criticize the, the, the dictator as much as some other writers do. I I think that they don't they don't they don't have anything against me from what I know. They've actually been supportive of my work. I have been invited to speak by the government of my country, but that was about my first book, which didn't say anything about dictatorship. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be invited for this book. But I'll say that so far, the embassy for my country in America and the government in my country, um, they've, they've only been kind to me, even though I don't exactly say the most wonderful things about them in public all the time, but they've been kind to me. <laughs> um, and this question I think had, was asked earlier, but I think you talked about it a little bit, but about like kind of the why it took so long to write this book. I mean, you talked obviously about writing and then taking a break. It sounds like you were also um, working when you first started you know, you weren't writing full time, but you know, and then you picked it back up in 2016. So if you have anything else you'd want to say about, you know, 
even the la latter part of writing this book and you know the amount of time that it took you right well i'll say that getting back to it in 2016 definitely made a big difference because um because of all what's happening in the news um i think um the flint michigan water crisis um and also sandy hook those certainly helped me create the voice of the children um, because before, before 2016, when I was writing the book, you know, before I started Behold the Dreamers, it was all from the point of view of just Tula. I wasn't thinking about the children in the village as a chorus. And for people who don't know, the, the children speak as a chorus, right? They, they speak in the first person plural all through the book. And Tula's family speaks in the first person singular. Uh, but in 2016, I was thinking a lot about... They're really the main, I mean, they're the majority they're half of the book right they're the yeah that is a little bit more than half of the book yeah. the children's voices but in 2016 i was thinking a lot about how it feels to be a child and how it feels to be a child in a world in which you don't think that adults are doing enough to protect you and so that is where that came from i also had read a wonderful book years before by the writer julio suka it's called the buddha in the attic and that book is uh, is told completely in the first person Lura. And so that that was a book that inspired me to, to say, okay, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and do this because it was important that I that I show the whole community because this is a story about the, it's about the community. It's also about certain characters, Tula, her mother, her uncle, her father, her brother, but it's also about community and it's also about this struggle. So I wanted to, to also make sure that they balance it out by, by showing how the community as a whole saw the events and also the struggles um, through the eyes of the children in the, in the community, how they look at life as children and what happens to them when they get older and how they start um, appreciating the, as the world also changes around because the world changes. This story starts in 19, 1980 and it ends in 2020. And so a lot of the world has changed and they've also learned a lot about the world. So a lot, um, it also allows them to change their perspective on many things. Hmm. We have one question that's actually a very specific question um, from somebody who read the book. Karen Sullivan, the intensity of the technique used by Jakani, again, please correct me, to save Juba was so strong and effective. What was the inspiration for this scene? Oh, well, <laughs> well, without saying too much about what happens in that scene, because that is, that is a scene that um, something quite supernatural happens. But I would say that I grew up in a world in which there was a lot of appreciation and respect for the supernatural. So um, I lived in a town where people, there were stories about people who paid, um, paid, paid a, uh, what's the word, a fetish priest, and people who paid somebody to, to send lightning to kill their enemies, or people who, you know, use love potions. There were all these sort of supernatural events in my town, and somebody would die and came back to watch over their child. All these things that we didn't really question. We just thought, okay, the world is, um, we don't need an explanation for supernatural events. It just happened. So that scene with Jackani and Juba, it is an expression of the kind of place that this village is, a world where there's a very thin line between the natural and the supernatural. Yeah. I mean, that, that really, really struck me about the, the you know, the deep beliefs mm -hmm. and the deep beliefs, uh, the, the recurring theme of the um, umbilical cords and just kind of what, and how much those beliefs tied into the relationship to the village and the right. relationship to place and how in a lot of ways, believing you had to be there to have those experiences. I mean, right. um, was really, and what brought, what keeps people coming back to places. Right. Even an outsider might think, you know, who would do that? Right. Um, you know, someone asked the question, um, has the book been optioned instead it would make a wonderful <laughs> book? I mean, and let me just expand that a little bit just to talk about obviously this being your second book, you know, your relationship. Um, you know, we are in a time where it's, we're seeing so many things inspired by other properties and just, you know, any relationship you might have to that idea. And obviously as a storyteller, you know, stories right. on basis. Right. Well, it's funny. The book just came out two days ago, but my agent emailed me and said, "There's all these people emailing from Hollywood about the book." And I said, "Okay, you know, you you do what you are. You, you, that, I'm not. That's not what I do. I write the story. I'm not involved in that part. But I will say that my how beautiful. No, the other one. What's it called? Behold the Dreamers. It was already up. It was it's option right now, not for a movie, but for a mini series. Um, but I don't know. You know, with Behold the Dreamers, it's funny because I, I I I think I was a little bit. Um, I'm a little, I was a little bit concerned about optioning that because 
I didn't trust that any old person can just get that right because this is a story about people from my town and I know how they look and how they talk and how they act. And, and then I went to see a play based on the, on the book in Seattle. And I was actually very impressed with the play. Um, so I, 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 so with this one, I mean, this is not exactly a very, you know, is it, I mean, I don't know how this can be filmable, but if anybody's interested, they can talk to my agent. But it's, <laughs> it's a very, it's, it's not as easy and to, to visualize and to see where well, you can visualize it. Um, but it is, the structure doesn't exactly lend itself to easy filmmaking the way Behold the Dreamer does. Totally makes sense. Uh, we only have a few more minutes left. We have one more question from the audience. If anybody else has any questions, please ask them. Uh, reminder to get the book. Um, and I also had a few other questions. I mean, on that note, you know, I'd love you to talk a little bit more about the idea of a second novel. You know, I think in the film world, we talk about that a lot. Like it's almost like the first book, uh, the first film is something, you know, you could work, push through no matter what. And they're, yeah talk about like you know this idea of a sophomore slump i mean i think it's yeah. <laughs> artists a lot of different things so i love you know here you are with a incredible book um unbeknownst to you with incredible reviews um you know yeah. i'd love you to just talk a little bit about the second novel experience right. book experience and how that's been for you right right so after behold the dreamers came out a lot of people said to me oh are you nervous because you know it, the, the novel did well it, um and they said are you nervous about your second novel or the pressure but i didn't feel any pressure because i had a book already that I just needed to finish right i think that if i didn't have a book maybe that would have maybe i would have been more in danger of having a sophomore slump but i didn't i had this novel already all i had to do was just go back and finish it but so i but now it's different because i don't have anything <laughs> i have to start i was just doing an interview with the new york times with the book review podcast and, and i was asked like so you have to start a new novel from scratch now and i said yeah what is that like how does it even feel to start a new novel from scratch um but i do think that um i am excited about doing something very different again i am i, I my first novel was set in New York City. The second one was set in a fictional African village. So I'm very excited about going to a whole new place, having a whole new experience, meeting very different characters. Um, that is that is part of what I feel is the great privilege of being a novelist, to, to be able to go and find new lives to inhabit and new people to like, you know, snoop into their world and learn new things. Amazing. Do you do a lot of research for your books? I mean, how much of it, you know, I know you talked about Behold the Dreamers and what inspired you in terms of your own experience, um, I think with the oil company, but what's your process with research and how much of, you know, how much does that play into your experience? Do you start writing first and then research later? Do you research first? Mm. Yeah, I, I do a ton of research. This book was heavily researched, <laughs> a ton of research. I, um, Something like oil expo oil exploration, for example. I don't know the first thing about oil. At least I didn't. There was an oil refinery in my town, but that doesn't mean that I knew anything about oil. I had to learn about oil wells and oil spills and pipelines and, and even all the dangers and what it looks like. I had to read books and academic articles and watch documentaries. So there was a lot of research there. But this is also a book that, that has to do with, with issues like the media, right? There's, there's a journalist in this book and, and what that relationship with the media, how it affected the village. So I had to also read about that. This is a book that has to do with this, this, uh, this an American nonprofit that tries to help this village and that relationship also with all with the, the, the people who go to developing countries to help and how it gets complicated. That is something that I also had to learn. Um, I had to learn about um, a lot of historical issues that I didn't know, um, something like even a minor issue, which is most people might not remember in this novel, there's the issue where the village has, the village goes to the situation where um, the Europeans come and, and basically enslave young men to, for them to um, for them to go and tap rubber because there was demand for rubber in Europe. That was heavily researched because I, I, I didn't even realize certain events that happened in Africa and this, this particular event happened in the Congo. So there was a wonderful book by a historian named Adam Hochschild. It's called King Leopold's Ghost. That book really helped me. So, and then again, Tula is a composite of some of the 20th century's greatest revolutionaries. So I read, I, I've read their biographies, but I also read memoirs of dissidents from across the world, dissidents in China, dissidents in, in Cuba, dissidents in, in, in East Africa. I'd had to, to understand the mind of, of, of people like Tula. I had to, um, 
and not 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 only revolutionaries, but even American um, like people like American entrepreneurs. So Steve Jobs. I read Steve Jobs' memoir. I read um, Bob Iger from Disney. I read his memoir. There's a certain um, way of thinking that I wanted to understand, appreciate. So I read a lot of of um, books about from people who are celebrated for for doing something really different. So a, a lot of it, um, it, it came from it came from heavy research. Now I didn't start off. I read a lot of these books just for my own personal enjoyment. Rather, I read, I read Mandela's you know memoir because I you know I, I, as an African as somebody who admired him, I read his memoir. But I didn't start off by researching anything. I started writing, and and then at some point I realized that I needed to get everything very accurate because. It is important to me that even though it's a fictional place, that it is real, even though the fictional characters that they are real, and I needed research to make everything be very real. I mean, it feels incredibly real. I had to almost like remind myself at various points, you know, not to like Google it. You know? <laughs> Does not exist out there. <laughs> but there are showers all over the world, and I was just talking on, the, on a radio interview today because they interviewer said, Kosawa feels like it's in America. And I said, Kosawa is all over the world. So I put it in Africa because that is what is close to me. But you could yeah. Kosawa and put it in South America. I could put it in, in Asia. It is, it is about a place that had all these forces to, so for so many, so many, such a long period of time converge and, and, and some ways overpowered it. And the people had to find a way to, to, put, to, to push back on that. Hmm. Uh, we have... Uh... I'm, I'll take a go a little bit like five minutes late here because we have a bunch of questions actually left and some really good ones. Um, you mentioned your fascination and you just talked about it with activists and activism and even in terms of your research. Do you think of yourself, you know, you said it earlier on, you know, no one would confuse you with a revolutionary, but do you think of yourself as an activist? <laughs> I, I wouldn't call myself that. I mean, I, I've met you once, right? And you told me the story of you and your husband and how you guys became this, this, um, this, uh, politicians and people who are very involved in making change. So I would think that people like you are what I would say as people that are active because you're making an active role. What I do is that I tell the stories of those people. <laughs> so it is, I, I wouldn't confuse that with actually doing it, right? I have never been part of a movement. I have never been part of um, any organization um, to that level. I have mostly focused on, on writing the story of these people that I so admire. Now that doesn't mean I don't take a stand. I also do things you know, on a more personal level, but I have never, and I don't even know, I, I've never even like joined a student club and <laughs> that was involved in anything. I'm just being honest about who I am. I, I am just, I was a young girl in Africa who dreamt of maybe growing up and getting a job with a revolutionary. So I didn't even realize that that wasn't even a, thing, even a thing that you couldn't just go and get a job, you know, like, I don't know, being, being some revolutionary secretary, but I just had this fascination with them. So, and it still it still goes on with time. It still goes on even now that I'm an adult. I still have this this amazement when I meet somebody who is taking the stand, and I go, my God, like how? like when I see you know Black Lives Matters protests, and I join sometimes and I walk with them. But the leaders, there's something that is so heartening to see people say, you know, when they stand up and they raise their fist, like it's just it's a beautiful it's a thing of beauty to me. So no. Nobody again is going to be mistaken for a revolutionary, but I, I, I go to book to celebrate them because I they are people that um they, they bring me joy when I see what they're doing. I mean, it's interesting. I actually really relate to. That. I mean, as well as, as I consider myself a storyteller mm -hmm. as well in many spaces. And it was um you know the last time I was in office was my freshman year of high school. I was the class president of Kingston High School. <laughs> well done. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I never thought about running for office again, and I don't think I ever will. But I think that, you know, and it is that idea that I ask myself a lot, like, what are, you know, are our voices activism? Mm -hmm. You know, people ask me that all the time, like, do I do I define myself as an activist? And, you know, and I think actually before my, you know, husband ran for office, and I did get very involved in that, a part of the thing that motivated me was the idea of not seeing enough people like us mm -hmm. in those spaces. And I have lots of friends who are, um, incredible activists and also mm -hmm. storytellers, but it isn't, I'm, I'm constantly asking myself that same question. Right. For me as somebody who studied law, but then decided to be a storyteller, really the idea of the power of stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I mean, your story has 
this book has stuck with me and is something that I, I find myself talking about numerous times a day. And I think that there is an, an, an activism in that that is pretty incredible, that is really incredible. Yeah. Uh, so I know I'm gonna try to get a few more in. Um, who are your literary heroes growing up? Hmm. Well, as a child, I mostly read African literature, so I will I will give some names that most people probably haven't heard of. But again, Gugi Wationgo was was a great writer, admire, um, an African writer named Elechi Amadi. There was um, there was a writer from Cameroon named Ken, Kenjo Jumban. These are also like writers who wrote books that I read when I was growing up, but. I didn't start writing until I came to America, right? Talking about America and how America shaped a lot of who I became as a, as a writer. I started writing because I came to an Ameri America and I and, and I discovered American literature and I, I discovered Toni Morrison and, and I discovered contemporary writers like Juno Diaz. That was Juno Diaz's book and um, Oscar Wilde was a big influence on me. Um, Barbara King Solver actually wrote a book that you know is quite similar to how beautiful we were because it's set in Africa and it also follows different points of view. Um, so I, I think that as much as I was inspired to write from the Americans, this book is actually an homage to the literature that I read as a young girl growing up, and and that I um I long to read more of because I between that love for revolutionaries and that that having spent my childhood in African villages, I just had this, this love for the simple African life that this village mm -hmm. was in danger of losing. So a, a lot of this novel is a love song. It's a love song to the revolutionaries. It's a love song to the people who, who, who support their causes. And it's also a love song to, 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 to the places that, that, um, that are just trying to hold on, that are just trying to survive globalization and <laughs> capitalism and neocolonialism. And it is a love song to, to just the beauty of, of, of having different cultures, which sadly is they've been they've been destroyed, they've been lost because of this globalization that is happening. Yeah. What about anything you're currently reading or other books that you would recommend? Oh, what am I currently doing? Well, I am currently reading quite a few, a few books because I read a little too much. But this is one book I'm reading. This is actually a book by my editor also published this book. This is a memoir, a wonderful memoir by an author who she used to write for the New York Times. And this is also a book that I'm also reading, a um, wonderful book also. This is a short story collection. I also am um, reading a... I just I'm have an audio book. I have a book by a French writer called Vanessa Springora, and it's about um, a young woman who was in a relationship with a, an older man. It's a memoir for many years as a teenager. So it's, it's called Consent by Vanessa Springora. Um, and then I'm also reading Kazuo Ishiguro's new book. He's one of my favorite writers, Clara Anderson. Love that. Yeah. Um, there's, I of course have like seven more questions I want to ask. I'll just ask one other from, um, Question from John, how is your idea of freedom in the United States? We talked about obviously freedom earlier and your idea of the country itself changed over the years since you arrived from Cameroon, especially during the Trump years, which you talked about kind of being inspired to pick this book back up to finish it mm -hmm. in, uh, in 2016. Hmm. Well, that's a good question because I don't, I think my idea of freedom has evolved and <laughs> not so much has changed. Um, I can't say that I thought about freedom a lot growing up, right? I came here at 17. But, but America certainly inspired me to, to question myself about what my freedom looks like. I think that, was, that is one of the many gifts this country has given me. It has, it has forced me to say, what does your freedom look like? And, and one of the things, my, one of the way, one of what my freedom looks like, one of the many ways it looks like is that it is for me to, to be true to myself. I didn't exactly, um, seek out to be a novelist, right? I, I, I wanted to be a college professor, but I think that now that I, I, I went through the journey to become one, I do feel free as a writer. Um, not because people appreciate my books and, or because it gets reviewed, but because freedom to me involves being true to who I am. And, and I am at the stage in my life where I am true to who I am, even if sometimes I may veer from that, but I am essentially true to who I am. And that is something that America showed me, that idea of freedom, um, that it's not based on what anybody thinks, but it's based on how I define my freedom and how I choose to, choose to live it. 
that's something I'm going to think about all night long <laughs> and about how do you figure that out? I mean, obviously there's so much uh, information coming at us. It can be confusing to mm. feel very influenced, but so it's incredible to hear that, that, that being, you know, but I, in a lot of ways, my business partner is Ethiopian and, and lives most of her time in Addis and she always reminds me how American I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's interesting to think about this idea of this cloud of America that I've always lived with mm. and how step outside of it maybe I could right. see it more right. I mean I have an advantage of having been born in another country and come here so I have that advantage where I I get to see America with new eyes but you were born here right so it's it's hard to separate yourself from it and see it with new eyes yeah oh my god I have four more questions and we are over time <laughs> I to tell you really I mean three quick things would you consider writing a sequel to behold the dreamers was my last no. question I didn't um, get to. maybe maybe Maybe, okay. One word, one word answer. <laughs> and then I just want, you know, um, as a creative person trying to find mind space, um, you know, I'd love any quick thoughts you might have about releasing a book during this time, doing a virtual book tour. You usually probably be on the road going to a million places. I'm sure you've been on a million of these uh, the next, uh, throughout the next days, over these days, you know, what that experience is like. And also just about like carving that time out to think it's something that I also have two young children. Um, you know, what I always like to hear about people's, um, you know, what is, what is your process like? How do you make the time to do that? Um, not just in terms of like actually having hours to work, but just actually getting the mind space, especially during a time when, um, it's been so complicated. Right. Well, I, 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 you know, I caught myself a lot of slack. Let me put it that way. I, I don't, I don't. Um, I mean, I've been incredibly busy. My, my publicity team is wonderful, and I've had a, a ton of interviews to do. Um, but I am, um, I am very, very big on, on having routines and creating space for myself to do what I need to do. So I haven't quite felt overwhelmed. But again, you know, I am. I don't exactly love to fly and travel. So this is. This is working out well for me that I'm not on the plane right now, even though I do miss being in front of live audience. Um, I am appreciating all of the benefits of not getting on planes right now. Um, but it's, I'm not writing now to be fair. So it's not as if, you know, I have, I am in that space. Right now I'm just focused on getting this book out because it, it just, it's been, it's been quite a lot, um, which thankfully I've been able to manage, but I haven't, um, I haven't been able to start writing something else. Um, I look forward to doing that maybe next month or two months time, who knows? But for I'm not putting any pressure on myself to start writing. And and my agent and my editors haven't started putting any pressure on me about what are you writing next. So I'm taking advantage of that to to not write and to just to just enjoy, you know, talking about this book that took me 20 million years to write and, and to just enjoy talking about it finally. <laughs> Well, congratulations. It's incredible. I also want to acknowledge again, thank you to Oblong, which is such, I mean, so you, and just to acknowledge that, you know, you're spending time with us upstate now. Mm -hmm. um, and so welcome again. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> beautiful, yeah. beautiful part of the world. I am glad I found myself here. <laughs> I'm glad. Well, we're glad as well. And especially, um, it's amazing to be doing this event with such a special space like Oblong, which even during this time has, um, I know for my family still been a respite in so many ways to go to, to find ways to escape. So really, really grateful to you for your work, to Oblong for having us here together. And I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you for, for I, I, I met you only once and you told me about what you and your husband are doing. So I, um, you guys are, in some ways, you know, two lads also, to, you know, in what you're doing. <laughs> so thank you for what you're doing and please keep it up and more, more strength to you both. And thank you, Oblon. Thank you everybody so much for coming and I wish you all well and have a good night. Yeah, really thank you me. both so much. That was a fantastic conversation. And Abolo, congratulations again on your fantastic new book. Have a wonderful evening. Okay, bye everybody.